So this is our fourth session together. And uh, uh, over the last three sessions, I think we discussed that there really has been an, the, uh, the elephant or elephants in the room. So many questions about PPE and the risk of COVID-19 infection. So we thought we would take this time to really go uh, a little bit deeper and address those. And then afterwards, hear from you about how you're feeling about, about uh, these issues, how you're dealing about it, and as a community of practice, we can work together to see how we're gonna get through it. Uh, here are my disclosure slides. Sorry, just trying to turn on my timer so that I don't go over. These are several ways that we mitigate potential biases. And here are our learning objectives. The first elephant is that uh, I, I want to address the fears and understanding of transmission and PPE in a little bit more detail. Next, I want to address the fears and risks of infection, and I think also death. I think another thing we're all afraid of is death and we don't talk about it. And finally, we're also afraid of the safety of ourselves and our loved ones. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. I think ultimately what's common between all three of these is actually the, the fear of actually getting infected and the fear of death. So I'm gonna start with that. Our librarians, Sarah and Terry, keep talking about ways of how you can assess what you're reading uh, and, and is, it, um, is it good literature? Should we trust it? And they've given us this acronym, uh, CRAP. Uh, Sarah doesn't like to say it, but Terry's fine actually uh, saying, saying the whole acronym. So my question to you is, how do you, what, about, what about me? Mona, how are you gonna assess uh, my authority? Uh, I haven't really gone into detail, uh, but in 2003, I was called in to the front line at Sunnybrook and I saw over 100 patients with SARS there. Then I was called in to the second wave of the outbreak and led that at North York where I saw over 300 patients with SARS. So I have cared for and seen 400 patients uh, with, a, with coronavirus. The illness itself is very similar to COVID-19, but the transmission is different. And uh, over the past couple of weeks, I read over 300 pa papers on the topic. I think it's important uh, to go over a little bit about the virus itself. Um, it's known as SARS coronavirus 2. Is it a bad virus? Yes. Is it a terrible virus? No. Coronaviruses are a group of viruses that were discovered in the 1960s. I say this because there's this idea that we don't know a lot about coronaviruses or stop SARS coronavirus too, and that's not true. Coronaviruses have been studied in detail, and there's seven of them. Four of them are common cold viruses, and in fact, they are the most common common cold viruses that are circulated um, every year, and likely the, the SARS co uh, coronavirus 2 virus is transmitted similarly to these cold viruses. There's three SARS-like coronaviruses, SARS, uh, with a 10% mortality, MERS with a 30% mortality, and COVID-19 with a 0.2 to 6% mortality. All of them are zoonic viruses, meaning they, they, are actually, they come from animals. All of them come from bats, and then they have a secondary animal. For COVID-19, the secondary animal is this cute animal called the pagolan. And why that's important is that, it, that they're actually transmitted easier in animals than they are in humans, so, which uh, influences that if we're able to stop the human-to-human -human transmission, we can get rid of the virus, viruses. Okay, why do I say that, that SARS coronavirus 2 is a bad virus but not a terrible virus? Well, you can see on this slide that Ebola is a terrible virus with a 40% mortality rate. Even the Spanish flu had a 10% mortality rate. Um, so, uh, SARS coronavirus uh, 2 on this slide, as you can see, has had an average of a mortality rate of 1.4%. It's a bad virus 
because that mortality rate is higher than seasonal flu, which is less than 0.2%. And that's really what's causing the trouble here is the high mortality rate of this virus compared to seasonal flu. Here you can see the Ontario mortality rate on this slide, and it's actually very similar to the mortality rates that have been reported in China. And what's unique about this, actually what's unique is the, the quite high mortality rate in individuals aged 80 and over at 16%. A higher mortality rate in, in elder and older people is actually also seen in, in a seasonal flu, but not to this degree. What about the risk of infection? So you can see here, um, I'm not sure you can see well, but this orange line is the rate of infection in Ontario. And it pretty much mirrors that in Canada. Uh, but we have been doing better than in other countries and other places. And uh, infectious disease specialists talk about the rate of infection using several different numbers. Uh, the most important one is this one called the reproductive number. When, a, uh, when uh, the transmission of COVID-19 started in China, the reproductive number was 4.7. That means that a single person who was, who was infected uh, would transmit to about five other people. When you start to put measures in place, you reduce that reproductive number. And so in China, it went down to 2.1. And now actually in China with social distancing, it's down to one and you want to get it to, to one or below one. And that's starting to happen also here. Another item that we talk about is the, which relates to the reproductive number is the doubling time. And, uh, and you maybe have seen from the other uh, Ontario government slides it, that in, in February uh, and in early March, the doubling time of, of COVID-19 um, in Ontario was about 14 days. When we got closer to the March 11th, March 16th time point, the doubling time went to five days. At its peak, our doubling time was three days. So that means double the cases every three days. I'm happy to say in more recent reports in Ontario, the doubling time is five days. So our, our, uh, our strategies are working. Um, this slide is also from uh, the, the modeling that uh, that Premier Ford presented on Friday, and it's the projections in terms of the, the deaths that can be anticipated uh, in Ontario. If we did full intervention, that meaning uh, restrictive social distancing, plus uh, uh, um, uh, uh, widespread testing and isolation of cases um, and so forth, uh, we could have 200 deaths. We're past that number. If we continue with our current interventions, we would have 1,600 deaths, and we're likely going to be uh, in between those numbers uh, someplace in Ontario. Why is this so important? And I'm going to explain. And if you haven't been listening yet, this is probably the most important slide, and Lisa, who's been on the front line, can probably confirm this. So what this slide shows is that in green, the green bars are the confirmed cases of COVID-19. The orange bars are what the, what the modeling has shown, or has shown is the worst case scenario. And what I want you to concentrate on are the blue bars, which is the projected uh, uh, number of cases in the best case scenario. Do you, see, do you see them? These purple lines are what the current availability is in terms of ICU beds and ventilators. This is what we have now in Ontario, 410 available ICU beds, and we have the capacity to go up to 900. What's crucial is to keep the case load below the level of the ICU and ventilator limit uh, in a region. Why? If it, with the blue line, if we're able to continue what our current interventions are with social isolation and, and testing and isolating, we, we can do that and then we, uh, the caseload will eventually decrease. 
if in the orange line we surpass the ICU bed limit, what will happen? People will die. Not only that, studies have shown that those people who are very, very ill have high viral burden. So then they're going to be in contact with their family mem members with, and, and transmit very high viral burden. And then those people will get very ill. And then what ends up happening, actually, if you surpass the ICU limit, is death begets death because of high viral transmission. And, th and that's what's happened in Italy, Spain, and New York. So it's key over the next several months to keep our caseload of COVID-19 below this limit of ICU beds. Okay, what about the certainty and uncertainty of transmission and PPE? I've gone over this a little bit in the, in the other uh, talks, and I'm going to repeat some things, but go into a little bit more detail. Um, the uh, WHO, China Collaboration, CDC, PHAC, and Public Health Ontario all say that SARS coronavirus 2 is primarily transmitted through droplet uh, through droplet and it's droplet transmission. And I looked through all the documents and they, they, there's no actual reference for that. And what that means is that the people who, are in all, who are, work for all of these organizations are what we call epidemiologists, infection control ex, ex, experts, and the way that the virus is being transmitted through close contact uh, is, it suggests that it's droplet transmission. Is, it, is that 100% for sure? I can't say it's 100%, but, it's, it, but, but these experts are saying that it's droplet transmission, and I do believe them. So uh, uh, Public Health Ontario says COVID-19 is transmitted via droplet and fomites, which I'm going to explain in a little bit, during close, unprotected contact between an infector and an infectee. Airborne spread has not been reported for covid 19 and it's not believed to be a major driver of transmission. However, they've also said that it could be aerosolized during aerosolizing procedures, which I think uh, people like Lisa uh, know about. What about transmitting or no, other theories? We've passed along uh, a, a reference for this interesting article that, uh, that, that talks about how the virus could be, uh, it, it could be a little bit, the, the distance of these droplets might be more than just a little bit further than the mouth, mouth, a mouth that actually there could be something created that's called a, a cloud turbulent gas cloud. So that means that when you, and especially when you talk or, uh, or when you cough or sneeze, that those droplets actually form a turbulent glass cloud and it's a little bit further. And I wouldn't be surprised if the coronavirus that causes the common cold is similar. There's also been discussions about that the virus can be aerosolized from talking and that actually talking uh, and, and droplets getting out might be a major way of transmission. How about transmission via contact? It sounds like that the possibility of contact transmission is there. This is the case for the common cold. And, uh, and droplets that are transmitted through contact are called fomites. And this is, this is actually a very common way all respiratory viruses are transmitted. You cough on your hands, then you touch a doorknob, then another person touches the doorknob, then you touch your nose. Um, and, uh, and the thought is, is that SARS coronavirus 2 is not different. This stresses how important hand washing is and surface cleaning is. Um, and, it, and many have said, actually, this is uh, uh, probably one of the most important components. In China, healthcare workers, they assessed healthcare workers that were donning and doffing um, uh, their PPE. And uh, they determined that, that healthcare workers who got infected, actually the thing that they didn't do was hand washing. There's, I also, last time I said I was gonna look into the evidence of asymptomatic transmission. Probably more important than asymptomatic transmission is pre-symptomatic transmission, meaning uh, someone is not symptomatic, but they've been infected and, and they develop symptoms uh, later on. And there's been over 11 papers on the topic of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission. And two of them have actually reviewed uh, case summaries of asymptomatic transmission. 
And there, there's uh, been a couple of studies looking at viral PCR in patients who are asymptomatic versus symptomatic. And I was surprised to see that the viral burden was the same in both. Uh, also an interesting paper from the Diamond Princess Crews and also from the Washington State Nursing Home uh, summarizing asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases. Exactly how much this is contributing, I can't say, but it does seem to be real. I thought this was uh, important, the evidence for, for PPE and that PPE works. This is a report from Singapore of 41 healthcare providers that were involved in a difficult intubation of a patient with confirmed COVID-19. They did swabs of the healthcare providers who were exposed for at least 10 minutes within two meters. 35 of them were wearing surgical masks and six of them were wearing N95 masks with the other required PPE. So face mask, um, uh, uh, gown and gloves. None of the 41 developed symptoms and all tested that virus negative. So PPE works. I, I also, I have a paper here um, that was uh, just sent to me and very recent of a uh, individual in China who had COVID-19 confirmed and was on a mini bus. And uh, his, the first mini bus he went on, he wasn't wearing a mask and there were 39 people on the mini bus and five got infected. And I don't know why, but for some reason he got on another mini bus and, uh, and, and bought a mask and put on the mask for the second mini, mini bus and after wearing a mask, there were no transmissions. And I will, they didn't say what type of mask, but I'm gonna assume it's a surgical mask. I'm getting close to the end of my slides. What, the, what there's a lot of certainty and uncertainty about what the best PPE is. And, uh, and does everyone need the best PPE? If you're caring for a COVID-19 pa uh, patient, I recommend following uh, what your hospital uh, is recommending. N95 mask for aerosolized procedures surgical masks, uh, face shields are very important when caring for, uh, for uh, COVID-19 patients. Gowns and gloves, many hospitals uh, are asking uh, care providers to, to remove the gowns and gloves and wash hands, but keep the mask and the, and the face shield on in between COVID patients until you leave the ward. What about caring for other patients? So if you're in another part of the hospital or in family practice. I actually work in a family practice office. There's been mixed messages. My personal feeling, having reviewed all of the literature, is I think we should be wearing surgical masks. And preferably, patients should be wearing surgical masks. If patients don't have surgical masks, those that are coughing should wear surgical masks. There's evidence that we can reuse PPE. I think maybe everyone saw the articles in the newspaper that the National ID Lab in, uh, in Manitoba uh, has, has found that, uh, that with heat for 15 minutes, uh, masks can be re reused 10 times and the federal government is deploying this across the city. What about cloth masks? I'm really sorry to say, but the cluster randomized control trial uh, that Sarah and Terry posted shows that cloth masks are not very good. So uh, I would not recommend using them in the hospital. If people are gonna use them out, uh, out and about uh, to pick up groceries, you know, maybe it's helpful for not touching the face, but people should still stay two meters away. There's lots of other uncertainties. When will the antibody test be positive, uh, available? Will summer have an effect? How long is this going to go on? It, it, how, how is this all going to end? And I think some of the items we're most afraid of are what if we get COVID-19 and, and what if we die? What if a loved one gets COVID-19 and dies? What if I pass it on to someone else and they die? And how are, well are there and everyone's safety uh, that affected it and how it's all affected by this uncertainty? I think the best way to overcome this is to arm ourselves with the information and to approach it in a logical and rational way. Uh, away through this crisis. And someone uh, sent me uh, this image, which I thought was really useful. So ask yourself, who do you or who do I want, want to be uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic? Do I want to be in a stage of fear? Do I want to be in a stage of learning or in a stage of growth? Here are the references. Thank you very much. <laughs>